I've been in the music industry probably now for 35 years. Um, first was involved with AES in the late 60s, probably 69, 1970, and uh, when I was first starting to get interested in record production and engineering, and went down to New York and went to, uh, I think it was the Astoria, the old Astoria building down there, uh, and started to wet my producing buds to equipment and gear and whatnot, and uh, subsequent to that, got involved with producing. Um, again, my background with musicians, working with bands and writing, and uh, had a few successes with, with some Canadian productions, but uh, then I guess the big change in my life, I built a studio uh, with a, a, a business partner, uh, Doug Hill, and we built phase one recording and opened the doors in uh, 1973. And uh, pretty well from day one, we had to make a go of it. Uh, didn't have a lot of big capital. So, uh, you know, from day one, we, we had to be successful. And uh, we brought George Simkew on board as our head engineer and seemed like hit the right era for the music industry because immediately we were busy, um, we were successful, and until I sold the business in 2001, which was about 26, 27 years, uh, we probably did 100 to 150 gold and platinum records, uh, not only to Canadian but international acts, and um, had a multitude of producers, engineers, all of worldwide credentials that walked through phase one. And I like to think that phase one actually developed a bit of a sound for its drum room. It was a unique studio. And uh, after I sold that business, I'm now working at Metalworks. I'm the studio manager and uh, still active. Um, I've produced a number of projects involved with the studio in conjunction with uh, AOL and um, iTunes right now. So. Still keeping my fingers in the production sort of hat, but um, mostly just a studio manager. Funny dimension kind of happened, um, I would say, in the 70s. Typically, and I, I'm talking rock, but rock drum sounds were very dead. Um, a lot of times they'd be put in booths, heavy dampening on individual drum skins, um, tight miking. You'd literally spend hours trying to make each drum perfect. And as the 70s went into the later part, part and parcel with actually one of the engineers that came from England, Alan Thorne, who worked at Trident in a bunch of studios, started to kind of awaken us to more of a live drum sound. And um, at phase one, we had quite a large studio, and the back half was very, very live. And we also had a big truck bay. And part of what that drum sound that we developed that had so many hit records attached to it was using that live drum room with a lot of ambient microphones and also opening the back bay doors and using some of that truck bay for quite a, not a gymnasium sound, but a very live, exciting sound. So um, you'd have kind of like that queen drum sound that was kind of starting to happen with more room, and it started to permeate all of the rock sessions that came in. So um, we did, I mean, bands in, that we recorded uh, internationally were Kiss and Alice Cooper, but we did uh, Streetheart, Triumph, Saga, uh, Honeymoon Suite. Uh, I could go on and on and on and on and on of, of these bands, and one of our biggest draws was our drum sound. and. It wasn't particularly sophisticated, but it was just the size of the room, the acoustics of the room, and how we would use the ambient miking to achieve that sound. As the industry was developing in those days, I think we got a lot of our influences more from England than the US. And we seemed to draw a lot of more of our sounds 
from an English base than the U.S. So I think Toronto was a little more contemporary, actually, than a lot of the U.S. studios. Uh, and so I would say that Toronto sound um, was a harder-edged, a driving sound. Uh, a lot of the bands certainly uh, had more edge than the U.S. counterparts. And um, I think that's where part of that Toronto sound came from. Certainly from phase one standpoint, we love to do rock and roll records. Um, like I said, the first three Triumph albums and uh, the Kiss and the Alex Coopers and Air Supply and Kim Mitchell and uh, Honeymoon Suite. Uh, we did the original Max Webster albums that Jack Richardson produced. Uh, so that kind of was that Toronto sound. In other words, it had some pop elements to it, but it had an edge. And I think that's what actually drove a lot of international acts to come up there because they were, as time was going on and FM was becoming a bigger medium for music, um, now you're looking for stuff that sounds that had a little bit more of an edge, uh, a worldly sound, and that's kind of what we provided. One of the first artists that came into phase one was Harry Chapin. And a lot of people may not know him, but he was a political activist as well as a great songwriter. And um, I actually got to pick him up at the airport and in the space of that 45 minutes was thoroughly impressed with him as a human being, uh, his ideology on where America was in the world still stands in my mind and the fact that he died in a car accident not that long after really impacted on me. Um, meeting Bob Dylan at the studio was amazing for me. Uh, you know, th those are the kind of, you know, things that stand out the most. The thing I will say that I think my, my, my legacy or what I, what I think is the greatest accomplishment is the engineers that came out of um, phase one and you know it, it I used to say the happiest moment in my life as a studio owner was when the engineer that I hired and trained left and uh, you know I, I, I can mention uh, Randy Staub who is working with and has worked with like Bon Jovi and Metallica and is one of the foremost mixers now or, or Garth Richards Garth Richardson or Lenny DeRose, um, you know, our, uh, engineers that actually came out of that studio and, and have done really well. So that's kind of one of my highlights, I guess.